In this session, we're going to be looking at case study research. So we're going to explore what case study research is, uh, the distinctions between case study research being a method and a methodology, um, its philosophical versatility, characteristics of case studies, the theoretical perspectives that encompass case studies, the different types of case studies, case study design, and the processes of conducting case studies, along with participant selection and data collection. So, what are case studies? Or what are case study research in particular? So essentially, a case study is allowing, allows us to explore in significant detail a particular instance or phenomenon, or organization, classroom, um, educational technology, and we go, we apply the case study as a process um, to collect as much information about that um, case as possible to enable us to study it. So that is essentially what case study research involves. It allows us to draw upon as much information as is available about a particular case so that we can better understand it. Now, of course, it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's its essential nature. So there are three, so four main categories of case studies. Ethnographic case studies, which are looking at um, the culture of a particular case, let's say a classroom. Um, looking at what's happening. Is there a, a culture in the classroom favoring uh, different genders? Or is there a culture in the classroom of conflict? So there can be a whole range of different aspects of, of a culture that we can explore through case study analysis. Historical case studies look at how things have differed over time. So we might look again at a school and look at what it was like five years ago, what it's like now, and we come back in another few years and look at it again, and building up an understanding of how things may have changed over that time. Then we have psychological case studies, and these look at the behavior um, that's being exhibited within the case. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be individuals. It might be the behavior of an organization, um, say a school system. But uh, fundamentally, it looks at changes in behavior. And um, it was epitomized by Piaget, who explored his own children's development um, in learning and examined how their behavior changed as a result of different stimulus and various other elements that he was exploring. And finally, we have sociological case studies. And this looks at how the socioeconomic differences, for example, in a school may affect students' learning. Um, students with particular advantages, have they got um, different learning outcomes as a result of those advantages? And it very much relies upon the demographics available to enhance our understanding of why different things may be happening within the case. So, the, one of the key aspects of a case study is defining or it's called delimiting um, the boundaries of the case. We can't study everything. As much as we'd love to, we can't study every aspect of the universe or even of a world or even of a school often. We have to specify what our case actually involves. Is it a particular classroom for a particular period of time um, and so forth? So down to its sort of lowest common denominator, a case could be a single individual or indeed it could be a single document um, and we could bound it by that. More generally, it's of a sufficient complexity that we can gather enough information about to make some findings and interpretations of those findings. So generally we would pick a class, or sometimes it might only be a few individuals within that class, 
Um, we might pick a school. Um, sometimes we might pick a school system. Um, at its highest level, we can take cases as countries and look at the school systems within different countries and how they're doing different things. But the boundaries are very important because that then helps us um, relate to how we interpret the findings within the case. So some of the critiques of case studies are similar to the critiques that happen in around qualitative research. Um, they can take a lot of time. It's much easier to just give a survey and turn that into numerical data and then analyze that data. Case studies involve collecting lots of rich information and data and then interpreting that and that interpretation is the other main criticism. Of course, it can lead to bias. Your choice of the cases is a bias-laden um, choice. Likewise, your choice of the boundaries, how you then set the parameters of what data you collect around the case, um, which aspects you focus on, which aspects you don't, um, which aspects you then report on or analyze, and then which aspects you report on and then publish on. So there's lots and lots of opportunities for bias to be part of qualitative research and case studies in this instance. So the way of addressing that is by making things transparent, by making it clear why you made certain decisions and making those upfront. Now, doesn't mean that there's still not bias there, but you've been upfront and open about those decisions, why you've made them. And so the reader, as they interpret your research, can do so through the lens of that bias. Um, so it is a critique of case study research, as it is of any um, qualitative research, but it doesn't negate it. Generally, case studies will still collect far richer in-depth understanding than quantitative research studies can attempt to do. And that rich understanding is an inherently in itself a valued contribution to the research framework. So case studies will give us this in-depth exploration of various phenomena and organizations and individuals and so forth. And we then have to analyze and interpret that richness and come up with some sort of findings and explanations. And that's the process of case study. So essentially there are a range of ways of doing this. Um, case studies can provide their own context in terms of being a series of cases. Um, but they can also be combined with other research methodologies as well, where you can use case studies as a method to gather data. Um, in this instance, as we're exploring it now, we're focused more on it being a methodology where it's a way we in approach research. Um, and we also use it as a method of collecting data, but it can be much more than just a method. Um, So some other aspects to look at is around the context that it's bounded by, how you actually frame your case study can very much determine its outcome and it's what it produces. If you go into a study, say of a classroom, and you frame it around looking at the, um, the amount of questions the teacher asks of the students, and that's how you're framing things, that's what you're focusing on, um, that provides a certain level of understanding of what's happening in the classroom. A different framing might be how students feel about being selected for questions or not being selected for questions and their um, understanding of what's happening through that questioning process. So two quite different framings that very much define how the research is conducted in these cases. But would provide very different outcomes based upon how the, the research has been framed, what things we're looking at, what questions we're asking, what 
is the main focus of the research study. Now, the difficulties then come in the transferability or generalizability of that research. Um, how we frame things can also influence how it can be used in other contexts. If we frame things quite broadly, then they tend to be more generalizable, um, where we can take that framing, let's say, looking at um, discipline within a school. We could look at discipline within one school, and then we could use probably that same technique and apply it in another school. If we framed it, though, at looking at the discipline techniques of a particular teacher over a particular time frame with a particular student that is going through a crisis at home to do a say, parental divorce. Now that's a much more specific framing that's much less likely to be generalizable. Still may produce some really interesting findings and some great outputs from the research, but its applicability in terms of being able to be then replicated and um, the results confirmed in another instance is much less because it's much more specific. Okay, so case studies provide us with a valuable way of looking at the world and looking at a particular aspect of the world through bounding the case and looking at particular contexts of that case. Sometimes though, we want to be able to go beyond just a single case. And this is where we often do multiple case studies. So let's say we've got a classroom or, and we're looking at the individual students. And let's say we're looking at their, um, their approach to homework. And so we look at one student's approach to homework and the homework they've been assigned and how they um, engage with homework and what benefits they gain from it and what other things um, are involved in that sort of particular case. And then we do another student and we look at that and then another student. And then by doing that, we can then look at the differences that different cases have um, shown. Why did one student really like homework and engaged with homework and, in, and it was a very positive process? Maybe it was that it provided them with time to interact with their parents who assisted them with the homework and it was a social um, bonding process. While another student had to do their homework on the, on the bus traveling to and from school because they had to do work on the farm when they arrived at home. And so their experience of homework and their circumstances of homework were very different. And so by then looking at the differences and similarities of different cases, we can then triangulate um, what things were evident. We look, look for patterns and see if, if they are happening across multiple different cases. Um, and they then tend to become more generalizable elements. But likewise, you might find a whole lot of specifics that weren't shown um, across multiple ones, and they become more specific instances that aren't generalizable. Both interesting research findings. So case studies allow us to explore these things in rich detail, where most other methodologies, particularly quantitative methodologies, don't allow us to go into such depth. Okay, so one aspect of case studies which is quite confusing to beginning researchers is the fact that it is both a methodology and a method. Now, as a methodology, it's a way we look at research. It's a way we approach doing research. The fact that we're framing things as cases, we're trying to understand things in depth, that frames it as a methodology. But likewise, we can use it as a specific, whoops, as a specific way of gathering data. Um, let's say we're doing it as part of an ethnographic study. So ethnography is our overarching methodology. But we're using case study as a method to collect data on a series of 10 cases that we're then going to explore through an ethnographic lens in terms of the methodology being used. We're trying to understand in depth the various interactions happening between the participants in these different um, cases. And that's the way we interpret and analyze the data through ethnography. 
rather than through case study as a methodology. So that's how case studies can be used as a method within a, another methodology. And of course, we would tend to use case study as a method within the case study methodology. Um, that's where it gets doubly confusing. But as long as you make it clear that you're doing it as a methodology and explain it as a methodology, and then when you come to describe your methods, you explain it as a method, which might also include um, conducting interviews and observations. So you can use multiple methods as part of um, case study methodology overall. But it's important to understand that it can be used in both ways, particularly when you're reading other people's research. Of course, if it turns out that they, were, they had a very different philosophical approach to doing the research and a methodology that they didn't really define, but it was quite different to case study methodology, but they still used case study, that will then give you a lens to interpret their work. Now, obviously, it makes it much easier if they are up front and explain that, and good researchers should always aim to do so, because it then helps the reader interpret the research. So then we have our philosophical perspectives. And one of the big advantages of case studies is that it can be applied to a whole range of philosophical approaches, different ontological, epistemological, and methodological positions. So whether or not you're approaching the research from a realist perspective or a positive perspective, you can still use research, sorry, method, um, case studies as a methodology because it's very adaptable to both types. Whereas some other types of research, say pure experimental, strongly supports a positivist perspective. Likewise, um, some of the more hermeneutic approaches, say um, ethnography, strongly supports a more realist perspective and not a positivist perspective. Now, case studies are very useful in that respect in that they quite comfortably bridge different um, philosophical perspectives. And we, we term that an, as an agnostic position on different um, perspectives on research. So one aspect, though, of case studies are that it is a qualitative inquiry. It still fits generally within the qualitative spectrum of research. Um, and it has some key attributes associated with that. It tends to downplay positive and post-positive perspectives to a certain extent. Now, you can still have a positivist or post-positivist perspective and conduct case study research relatively um, coherently because you can focus on the data collection processes of relatively empirical data and you can do triangulation between case studies, um, the data collected from multiple case studies, and you can apply some statistics to that. So it can, it can sort of lend itself towards a little bit of that aspect, but it is still in the qualitative camp of research. But it also then, in that camp, it can quite readily accommodate the more extreme approaches, uh, particularly around the postmodern aspects. So feminist studies can incorporate case study um, quite well whereas some other more positivist approaches would have much more difficulty um, accommodating a, a feminist perspective on research. So there are aspects of flexibility that are relatively unique to case study research. It can be very useful in capturing an individual's point of view. And essentially that's what you're doing as the researcher. You're capturing your perspective on a particular research problem. And again, that's one of the criticisms of it. There's a lot of opportunity for bias there, but as long as it's transparent and open about how you've gone about doing that and the perspectives that you've overlaid onto your research, then it can be um, quite accepted as such. It can incorporate the constraints of everyday life quite well and explore those. So the fact that, um, let's say you're studying a class and looking at um, homework and all the rest, and there's suddenly a school sports carnival. Now, in many research studies, that would interrupt the process. You would not be able to collect data about homework 
because of this interruption. In a case study research, it simply provides another lens of looking at the cases. What happens when you have these sorts of interruptions to the homework processes? Is there homework then given that day? Is there, is it quite acceptable for there not to be an engagement of homework around that sort of context? So there can be whole elements that what are seen by other research processes as being problematic that can be quite readily accepted within case study research. And of course, as we've mentioned, it can provide really strong, rich descriptions of the subjects being, or the subject of research being explored. So this gives an, an overview of the historical development of case studies um, and the distinction between the humanist and the natural sciences, um, where the humanists, particularly in the 16th and 1700s, were very much collecting data on their journeys, going on a journey to Australia and collecting all the botanical data that they could and giving an account of their um, interactions with indigenous uh, members of different countries that they visited and the fauna and fauna that they um, were able to engage with. And very much it was tied with anth anthropological and field studies and then more later into ethnographic studies of going into different communities and trying to understand them in depth. While on the positive side, on the, on the natural sciences uh, perspective, it was much more around conducting experiments and collecting lots of statistics and analyzing that statistics. And case studies were then being used to cross that boundary. More recently into the 1900s, um, case studies are being used more explicitly to be able to incorporate um, natural science processes and humanities qualitative processes to combine them into research studies. So taking the best of both worlds. Now we're seeing a little bit about that in um, other methodologies, particularly around grounded theory, which is, some of us interpret that as a specific um, instance of or a specific type of case study, although grounded theorists don't accept that. They uh, consider it very much a distinct one. And certainly it does have elements that aren't generic to many other aspects of case studies. But we've also got the emergence of um, other methodologies, particularly those that have multiple mixed methods um, that some other people interpret as very much instances of of case study research, but that's another whole debate around mixed methods. So with this wonderful tool of case study research, you're able to explore particular um, cases in great depth, and it very much does draw upon concepts of constructivism and interpretivism because you're really constructing knowledge and understanding about a case, and you're very much interpreting the data that's available to form that understanding and build that or construct that knowledge and understanding. So we generally use a range of different tools and methods within case study research, observations, interviews, focus groups, document and artifact analysis, all provides rich data on which to understand what's happening or understand more aspects of the case that you're exploring. Now, of course, you're going to be part of that process, as I've mentioned before, and in order to limit the criticism of bias, you need to make it open as to how you're going about your interpretations and use what's called a reflexive stance. So reflecting upon how you're doing your research and making it clear to the reader when they read your results, when they read your methodology, how you've gone about doing that. And one of the methods is memoing and journaling where you note down um, not just your approach, but also why you're making certain interpretations. What's leading you to um, look at things in this particular way. 
Okay, so then you've got your methodological position um, and you're exploring your cases through this particular lens, your worldview. Now, the reading that I've provided, one of the readings I've provided by Harrison, Burks, Franklins and Mills on case study research foundations and methodological orientations will take you through in more detail the different philosophical uh, perspectives or positions that uh, researchers conducting case studies can have and how those different philosophical positions can impact upon how they go about doing case study research. So have a look at that reading and look again at the philosophical perspective that you identified in the first couple of weeks of the course and how it can be then applied to your interpretation of case studies as you're now going about conducting your own case studies. So, some characteristics of case studies. What makes them different to other forms of research? So there are certain characteristics that are um, similar to all case study or case studies. First is that it is a qualitative inquiry. So we're trying to understand something. Um, now, it may be a comprehensive understanding where you're really trying to get a really in-depth investigation of a particular phenomenon, event, situation, organization, program, individual or group. Um, but it can also be holistic in that you're trying to get an overview of how all these things interrelate. You have a context where within the boundaries that you define, you've got a particular aspect of these individuals or organizations or programs that you're trying to look at. But there'll be a number of variables around that. So whereas in more quantitative research, you would only have one or maybe a couple at most variables, invariably in qualitative research and in case studies, you will have a, a number of variables. But where possible, you should at least try to define these. It'll make it so much easier when you come to do your analysis um, as you can limit down the aspects that you actually interpret and study. Now, you don't want to limit things down too much, and as we'll talk about the different types of case studies in a second, but it is important not to try to examine everything course the world is just far too complex and education is just as complex as any other aspect of social dynamics um, okay so the various stages of a case study is conducting research collecting your data defining the conditions of the of the research setting your boundaries setting the, um, the focus the lens of what you're going to be exploring examining the data that you've collected, trying to understand that, um, describing your method and how you've actually gone about doing it, doing it in depth, exploring your data or the cases in depth, analyzing that and producing some sort of result. So all of these things form part of what we define as case studies. So first off, you have to have a case. So something that you're studying. So the object of your, of your case is identified and it may be a program of study it may be an individual it may be a group of students it may be a social situation such as the classroom it may be a school it may be how the school works as an organization it might be an event happening within that school say a, a robotics competition um, or it could be a phenomenon say um, instances of bullying um, or it could be a process such as the way the school reacts to instances of bullying um, all of these things form cases. Now we can have multiple cases. So for example, you could look at instances of bullying and then how the school reacts to bullying as two different cases within um, a case study. But you need to define what is the unit of interest? What is it you're, you're actually studying? What is it that you're interested in? Then you need to bound that. So this could be by time, space or activity, but you need to set some boundaries. 
This then allows you to analyze that case within those boundaries. Um, it can though incorporate multiple cases and interactions between them. And there'll be certain variables that you'll be exploring within those boundaries. And the context and the case can be blurred. So the, the context of what you're studying within the case um, can have some blurred boundaries between cases in particular. Um, so if you're studying, say the context is around students' interpretation of homework, but you may then also want to get some teachers' interpretations of that. And so you can then incorporate those into um, your analysis of the case study. Okay, so it can be studied in a real life context or natural environment. So it's one of the advantages of case studies is that we can go out and um, immerse ourselves in the cases, but it doesn't always have, have the opportunity to do that. You may be studying historical cases, which happened many years ago, where you are relying upon um, the records that have been kept about those cases or interviewing people about how they remember those cases. Um, and again, the context is important to frame that because it allows you to then analyze the, those cases. So what about them are you studying? What about them are you interested in? Is it the how students engaged with a particular phenomenon and that impacted upon their academic outcomes? Or is it about the stu how long the students stayed within educational systems or dropped out of educational systems? quite different contexts that can be applied in very similar cases. But they can also be influenced by different political, economic, social, cultural, historical, or organizational factors. All of these things help define the context, what it is you're interested in about these cases. Okay, so you've chosen this case for in-depth study and analysis. Field work is generally an intrinsic part of the inquiry process around cases. You know you're going to be subjective and you're going to be sub there's going to be bias, it's going to be influencing you. And you're going to have to keep track of that in order to mitigate that bias so as to make your research results transparent to the reader as they interpret your results. You select your case, set the boundaries, um, Work out who it is you're going to be studying, the scope in terms of how broad or um, you're going to be studying. Is it just a single case? Are you looking at multiple cases? Um, are you looking at different things within a single case? So there could be one case of a single class, but looking at different students within that class. Um, are you after everything about the case or after you? Have you been able to frame things so that you're after some specific aspects? And what methods are you going to be using? Um, are you trying to obtain replicability? Is it, are you trying to make it generalizable enough so that other researchers can do the same study and get the same results? Or are you after a really specific instance that you know that it's not going to be replicable, but you want to explore it in great depth because it, that instance in its exception will provide insight around the case that you're exploring. You do want to try to have multiple sources of evidence. So you want to collect data from more than just one source. Um, this is why we often collect so interviews and observations and focus groups, and artifacts and documents and questionnaires and surveys to get lots of sources of data. Of course, when we can do that, we can then triangulate. We can sort of say, okay, these are all agreeing. So that greatly strengthens at the arguments we make from analysis. If we can see very disparate um, sources of data, it could be just down from different um, subjects. So if the teachers are saying one thing and the students are saying the same thing and the administrators are saying the same thing and the, t and the parents are saying the same thing, then that's probably going to be much more likely to be what's happening than if we only ask the students whether or not they liked homework and or there was benefit to homework and they would give 
it from their perspective, which may be very different from other perspectives. We have different designs in our case studies, and the main aspect is the different types of case studies, whether or not they're descriptive, exploratory, explanatory, illustrative, or evaluative, um, whether or not they're focused on a single or multiple cases, whether or not they're embedded or holistic. In this case, we're talking about whether or not you're really getting involved in, in one particular case in great detail, or whether or not you're trying to look at um, a whole range of aspects of that case, which tends to make it more generalizable. So you're looking more holistically at the case. Sometimes that's um, more beneficial, but sometimes getting embedded is the only real way to really understand what's happening. So you really have to dig deep into how one student is engaged with homework and getting into really great detail about um, how they go about doing it and what interruptions occurring and how that relates to their studies to give enough in-depth understanding to be able to truly explain what's happening. Whereas a more holistic view may not have been able to allow that in-depth embedding. Whether or not it's looking at a particular instance or aspect of the case, or more heuristically looking at um, it overall, or is it simply descriptive, looking at what's happening without trying to worry too much around explaining and worrying about it being a particular instance or a general instance, you're more just trying to just overall describe what's occurring. And again, whether or not it's intrinsic, instrumental or collective, this is again how specific the case is. Is it down to a one really intrinsic aspect? So maybe if we're looking at homework again, we're just focusing on the amount of homework. That's the key aspect of homework that we're exploring. We're not worried about all the other elements of homework. We're just looking at the quantum of homework. Whether or not it's instrumental, is it something that's fundamental to the process or to the aspect that we're looking at? Um, so maybe it's the aspect around feedback on homework. Is that an instrumental aspect of homework that is fundamental to why homework is given? Um, or is it a collective aspect? Is it looking at a whole range of aspects of, of um, homework, um, why it's given, how students respond to it, how it interrupts family life, how it interrupts um, their studies or supports their studies, and looking at things collectively. Okay, so back to the theoretical perspectives. There are different approaches, again, we can take to case studies based upon our what we want to actually study and the theories that we bring to that study and in particular to the analysis of that study. So as a researcher, you'll have various theories. So let's again stick with homework. There's certain theoretical understandings of homework. So there are individual theories, say around um, cognitive behavior and how that's impacted on by homework or students personality development and how that relates to homework, where some students say, say we're using the Myers-Briggs test as a theoretical lens to understand students' homework. And we have some students that are, their personality is such that they're really meticulous and engage with doing homework primarily for the purpose of going through and ensuring that it's done. That's their main focus on homework. Whereas we have another personality that may be looking uh, so very entrepreneurial, looking at what advantage they can gain in their studies of having done that homework. What benefits do they gain towards doing better on the exams and assignments? And we have other students that might be very much related to interpersonal relationships and how they build a strong relationship with their teacher. And that's the focus of doing their homework in that it strengthens that relationship. A whole range of different theories around um, behavior and other aspects that we can then bring to play in trying to understand what's happening in our case studies. But we also have organizational theories. Why does an organization such as a school have a homework policy? And what functions does that have within a school environment? Does it improve student discipline? 
in terms of regimentation and um, and so forth? Does it provide discipline around teachers to ensure that they're covering the content? Um, there can be a whole range of different aspects of of theory that helps us understand how organizations work in terms of management theory and um, and so forth that can help us understand why we might have a policy implementing homework. And then we have social theories that look at behavior and cultures. Why do parents want homework to be given? Is it because when they went to school, they had to have homework and so they feel that their children should have homework? Um, or is it around different um, social dynamics around um, advantage and a whole range of different social theories that can be brought to play around who has advantage in society. Those that have opportunities to do homework at home with the resources of available at home to be able to engage with homework and parental support and um, tutors and all the rest that might give them social advantage compared to other students that have part-time jobs or have to work at home that don't have opportunities to engage with homework and that are inherently disadvantaged through that process. So there can be a whole range of different theories that we can bring to play when we come to try to understand what's happening in our cases. So again, there are a range of different types of case studies. Explanatory case studies are trying to um, explain what's happening. So we can go into a school, we can look at what's happening say, with their homework, and study that and then come up with an explanation of why some students like homework and some students don't. We can also have descriptive um, studies which tend to go in with a theory already in place. So let's say again we're looking at Myers-Briggs as a personality types and we're going to apply that to look at the range of students and their personality types and then how they engage with homework and the successful outcomes as a result of that homework and relating that to their personality types and using that to try to describe what's happening in a school. So we're not necessarily trying to explain it. We already have an explanation. We've got a theory that we're, we're coming, to, coming into the place with that we're trying to describe then how that theory relates to a particular case. Then we have exploratory studies which very much touch on what I was talking about before, grounded theory, where we don't go in with any preconceived ideas and we're not really trying to explain what's happening. We're simply trying to explore all the phenomenon that's occurring within a case and develop some understanding of what's occurring. And that can lead to really deep insight into things that we wouldn't necessarily have thought of beforehand. Explanatory studies tend to be quite superficial and are often used as um, precursors to more in-depth studies. So we might go in and do an explanatory study or an exp um, to just sort of understand what's happening and then come in later and do a more in-depth study. Whereas exploratory studies can be very in-depth and can lead to some really complex findings um, that involve a lot more work. Okay, so there are a few other ones. Um, illustrative case studies uh, where we pick some situations. Let's say we want to look at how um, a particular technology is being used in a school. Let's say virtual reality. And rather similar to descriptive studies, we would um, illustrate that use of technology in that particular um, institution. We've got exploratory and case studies, um, again, looking at things and trying to explore what's occurring in those um, instances. We have cumulative case studies where we try to gather data over time, uh, particularly when you've got an opportunity to come back multiple times to an instance over many years and these can give quite interesting studies um, 
particularly these can be done when you have documentary data. So let's say looking at curriculum changes over time. So how may be the English curriculum has changed over the last 10 years in Australia. And you could look at different cases in different states and different, or even um, the English curriculum being the case and explore it over time. And then we have critical instance case studies where we're not so much worried about trying to uncover generalizable um, findings again. We really just have a specific outlier that we want to explore in more detail. Let's say we have a particular school that's got no homework policy at all and the students are doing phenomenally well. And we want to go in and try to understand that. So we're not really trying to understand how homework is um, impacting upon education and all the rest. We just want to find out what's happening in this one specific critical instance. Okay, last one, our confirmatory case studies is where we try to go in and we, again, we've got a theory and we want to actually confirm that it's working or not, uh, or it is in place or it's not. Um, we don't do a lot of confirmatory studies in education, uh, but it can be very useful. And we can go in and try to just see what everyone expects should be happening is actually happening. Okay, so the design of case studies. There can be a whole range of different processes. We've touched on a few of these things already. We need to identify what we want to study, what data is going to be useful, what data we can collect, and how we're going to analyze that data. And there are a range of different processes for designing case studies. Um, this is just one exploratory case study where we do some interviews. We then do some in-depth cases based upon those interviews. Um, we build a base model of what sort of what we think is happening and then we develop some comparative examples so from that base model of what we consider is happening we then present a range of different um, examples or cases of what's happening so one case when students are engaging with homework one where they're not engaging with homework and one where they didn't even know they had homework and they're just totally disengaged with the process of setting homework. Um, and then we may go back and do some more interviews and explore things in more depth once we've come to that understanding of what these basic cases are happening. So again, we'll have some questions we want to have answered. We'll have some propositions that we make from those questions as to what we think is happening. Um, we don't do that in an exploratory study but we do in, often in many of the other studies particularly we've got if we've got a theory that we want to actually see is happening in that instance we'll have our units of analysis of what is it about those cases that we're actually studying um, we'll have some logical ways of linking the data that we're collecting to the propositions that we're making so if we think that it's going to be related to say their personality types um, we're collecting some data on their personality types, we're collecting some data on their effectiveness of, of um, homework in terms of how it helps them with their study. And then we can then make some relationships, do different um, personality types, impact upon homework in different ways. And that will then form our criteria for interpreting the findings. So if our criteria is that if there is some sort of positive improvement in their quiz stores scores, then we can say that that may be related to the amount of homework that they've done, which may be related to their personality um, impacting upon that. Whereas another personality type who may have done the same amount of homework may have not achieved um, the same positive results. And so we can then make some sort of interpretation around how personality types affect um, uh, student outcomes dependent upon how much homework they're doing. So we can do a whole range of different interactions then and explore those aspects. Okay, so pose to teams a case study question that you could investigate, something that you would find interesting and that would fit within the parameters of case study research, which is pretty broad. So conducting case studies. 
Here again, I've provided you with a reading to go through in more detail the processes of conducting case study research. Uh, Hancock and Al Ghazin have provided a detailed explanation of the processes of going about conducting case study research, the different methods that can be employed around collecting data, observations, self-reports, student interviews, all those sort of techniques that we can utilize in an educational setting to provide us with the rich data that we need to conduct our case studies. One of the key aspects is around participant selection. Case study research can't have too many participants. Because we're going into things in depth, having thousands or hundreds, even dozens of participants becomes too many. The smallest case studies can be on a single individual, probably too small. Generally, most case studies work on half a dozen to a dozen. Um, which is good in an educational setting where we often don't have access to a large number of participants. But if you did have large numbers of participants, then you'd probably be more beneficial to go towards a more quantitative or some other qualitative methodology that allows you to engage with a broad holistic overview rather than going into things in depth, which is the strength of case study research. But our case studies Participants can be drawn from a whole range of different um, elements of the cases. Um, there can be a range of individuals and groups and classes and schools and organizations or even countries. But even within those, you've got different subgroups, such as parents and students and teachers and so forth. But also even within that, you've got different types of teachers, different subjects that they teach, different age levels that they teach. Um, different personality types or different approaches to teaching? Are they more constructivist or more um, authoritarian in their teaching? It can be a whole range of different subgroups. Likewise with students, there can be a whole different range of genres of, of students. Um, so how you then break apart your subjects and define them and contextualize them and set the boundaries of your case study can be important. So again, into teams um, and provide an example of a population that you could use to answer the question that you've decided upon around conducting a case study. So data collection is the next real stage. How to collect enough data to make this rich analysis of your case. So we've talked a few about these uh, around documents and archival records, particularly um, digital archival records are now becoming very popular because they tend to collect quite a bit of data. Conducting interviews with students. Um, we often also tend to use survey data in educational case studies quite a lot, but it's really just an adjunct to interviews, just collecting simpler questions. Um, direct observations, going in there and actually observing what's happening. Or sometimes you can use film data, you get someone to film it for you or just set up a camera in a classroom. Um, I've also used screen recordings, capturing what students do on a computer screen. Um, participant observations, we actually go and observe the participants in particular, so not just observing the whole class, but focusing in and having in detailed observations of the participants. And again, in this case, often would set up four or five cameras and they would watch each a number of individuals. Um, and I also have one often on the teacher and how they how their body language um, reacts to different instances can provide quite an interesting collection of data. Um, whereas how they respond to questions can be quite different. And then there's also artifacts, things that are produced, such as student essays or students' works, reflective diaries, a whole range of different things where you can collect data um, to support your case study analysis. So again, in Teams, post some of the different sources of data that you could utilize. And in the readings, you'll see that they go through and in detail a range of other data sources that you may wish to consider. So that's it for this session. In our next session, we're going to look at how to analyze what we collect through case study research. And I look forward to discussing these issues and the readings 
in more detail in the tutorials.